Things are wall to wall on radio and television of current affairs programmes, but this is the one where you, the public, here in LBC, get your chance to have your say. And I'm going to be really interested this morning. Um, in the first hour, we're going to talk about Trump. Trump at Davos, Trump with the Piers Morgan interview, Trump's comments on Brexit and the Prime Minister. And from 11, uh, we will talk about the Conservative Party and whether it is doomed if it stays on its current course. And regular listeners to this show will know, I have now been saying for six months that she's watering Brexit down to such an extent that she will begin to split her own party and lose her own vote. But this week was really interesting. Davos, the World Economic Forum, uh, not something that American presidents regularly attend. And indeed, it's 20 years ago since Bill Clinton went to Davos. And of all the people to go, Donald Trump. And, you know, you'd have thought, wouldn't you, that it was rather like Daniel going into the lion's den because all of these big businesses have been really fiercely critical of him. Uh, many of the other world leaders, particularly those in the European Union, uh, were very suspicious of him. But Trump arrived at Davos, and frankly, um, it, it was like sort of Michael Jackson in his heyday arriving. Uh, people queuing for an hour to get in to listen to him. Here's just a flavour of Trump at Davos. I'm here today to represent the interests of the American people and to affirm America's friendship and partnership in building a better world. I'm here to deliver a simple message. There has never been a better time to hire, to build, to invest, and to grow in the United States. America is open for business, and we are competitive once again. We support free trade, but it needs to be fair, and it needs to be reciprocal. Because in the end, unfair trade undermines us all. So America is booming. America is open for business. And, you know, this is what Trump does. He talks in a hugely upbeat way about his own country. Now, whilst he was over there, Piers Morgan uh, managed uh, to get, for Good Morning Britain, managed to get the first overseas interview that Trump has done for a year. Now, this is going to be played at 10 p.m. tonight on ITV. But we have got a few clips of it. And one of the big questions that Piers Morgan asked him was about, do you remember the retweet of the Britain First stuff? Let's hear what the president had to say. I don't want to cause any difficulty for your country, that I can tell you. And, can I get, a, and, and can I get an be... apology out of you just for the, the retweets? Of well, if you're first. telling me... I think it would go a long way. Uh, then uh, here's what's fair. If you're telling me that's a horrible people, mm. horrible racist people, yeah. horrible, I would certainly apologize if you'd like me to do that. I know nothing about them. Uh, and you I, would disavow yourself of people like that? Uh, I don't want to be involved with people, right. but you're telling me about these yeah. people because I know nothing about these people. And that, you know, I'm, I'm not in the least bit surprised that Trump said that. The way that it worked, actually, is that Trump now has over 47 million Twitter followers, but only follows back 45 people, one of whom is a US conservative commentator called Alan Coulter. It was she that retweeted the Britain First stuff, and he retweeted her. He also, Piers asked her, about his relationship with the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. You have a very good relationship with your Prime Minister, who I just left, and she's been doing a, I think she's been doing a very good job. Uh, we actually have a very good relationship, although a lot of people think we don't. Uh, I support her, I support a lot of what she does and a lot of what she says, and I support you militarily very much. I mean, we will come to your defense if anything should happen, which hopefully it will never happen. But I am a tremendous supporter of the UK. My irritation with my country, we've given state visits to Bashar al-Assad, to Robert Mugabe, to Vladimir Putin, and to President Xi. So the implication from them trying to ban you is that somehow you're worse than they are. Well, I hadn't heard about banning, but I think a lot of the people in your country like what I stand for. They respect what I stand and for. To those who and don't, I do stand for tough borders. I, I'm going to come to that now, but yeah. to those who don't, what do you say to them? I don't care. I don't care. It's just one of those things. I don't, I don't say anything. You know why? Because I don't care. <laughs> well, that's very Trumpian, isn't it? If you don't like me, I don't care. Actually, I'll tell you what, for politicians, that's quite a useful thing. Because if political figures worry too much about what the opposition think of them, they finish up not saying or doing anything. So he's being very nice about the UK. He'll defend us, whatever the cost. He wants to have a trade deal with us. He does want to come and visit at some point in time. But here is the sting in the tale, the impact of which I think may be quite significant upon Theresa May, because he was asked about how he thought 
the Brexit negotiations were going. Would it be the way I negotiate? No, I wouldn't negotiate it the way it's negotiated, but I have a lot of uh, respect for your prime minister, and I think they're doing a job. I think I would have negotiated it differently. I would have had a different attitude. What would you have done? I think I would have said that uh, the European Union is not cracked up to what it's supposed to be. And I would have taken a tougher stand in getting out. Are we front of the queue or are we, are we behind the French? Because we're a bit worried about Emmanuel Macron, who's been all over you, trying to be your new best friend. No, I like him. He's a, he's a friend of mine, mm. Emmanuel. Uh, <laughs> he, he's a great guy. His wife is fantastic. I like him a lot. Well, there was Trump. Trump perhaps proving the point that you can get on with people with different points of view. Now, look, cards on the table. You know, I thought Trump was a very necessary thing. I supported Trump. I spoke on the platform in Mississippi with Trump. Um, I went back for the debates he did against Hillary. I was there in the spin room. Um, I thought Trump was a very necessary part of change that was needed. I thought he'd be good for America. I thought he'd be good for Britain. And I thought he'd be good in the battle that I've been engaged in for over 20 years, namely fighting the big unelected bureaucracies and putting the concept of nation-state back where I think it needs to be. Is he a bit rough and ready at times? Yes. Can he sometimes be his own worst enemy by picking endless fights? Yes. Uh, but I feel, I feel I was right to do those things back back then um, and to stand on the platform with him and i noticed after his speech at davos lloyd blankfein the boss of goldman sachs and i mean goldman sachs and trump pulls apart blankfein saying do you know what actually there was a lot more in this speech i liked than i didn't like sir martin sorrell the boss of WPP, biggest advertising agency in the world, world and Sorrell, very much against Brexit, very much against Trump, saw him interviewed, saying that, that actually, you know, this was a president that understood business, and he speculated that maybe in the midterm elections in November, Trump might do better than people thought. So in the world of business, there's definitely a shift of people saying, hey, do you know what? He's not as bad as we feared he would be. Amongst politicians, <coughs> what I think by the time this Piers Morgan interview has been played tonight, I think the European <laughs> Union and, and the bosses are going to need the smelling salts because he clearly is vehemently opposed to unelected bureaucracies having this level of power. But what about you folks? Because I took, I probably took more stick for standing up for Trump than I ever did for daring to take on the European Union, even more stick than I took for daring to talk back in 2004 about open-door immigration. So I'm asking you, in the light of what you've seen, his, his behaviour, his style at Davos, the snippets we've seen already of the Piers Morgan interview, the things he's saying about the United Kingdom and our future relationship, I'm asking you, whether you have changed your mind, whether I'm no longer alone in thinking he's more a force for good than bad. So you can call me. You know, if you think he's better than you thought, please call me on 0345 6060973. -60 if you still loathe him, whatever he says or does, well, you can text to 84850, although within reason. I mean, don't be too rude, please. Um, and if you think perhaps he's right about May being weak on the European Union, then tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, you can watch us on Facebook and comment there too. Um, I'm a fan of the straight talking man that is the Donald. Nope, he ain't perfect, but who is, says Eileen. And she does that via text. My first caller is Joe, who's calling from Nantwich. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? Are you well? I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm well when we talk about Trump and what's happening in America. I'm less well when we talk about May and Brexit, but we'll do that after 11 o'clock. So, Joe, you know, one year on, you know, is he doing better than you thought he would? Well, I was very fortunate in 1986 to actually meet Donald Trump when I was in New York. My father was uh, very friendly with a chap called Henry Bennett, who he actually built was a construction um, for uh, Trump Towers. So I was very fortunate to meet him long before he became um, okay. the Trump of today. Um, uh, you know, as you said, when he walks into a room, you go, wow. You know, and I shook his hand. I didn't say much to him, but I was very fortunate to meet him. You know, I, I, I listen to everything he says, and it's the first time I've ever heard an American leader, um, which I find quite amazing, state to the world, that, you know, if England was ever in difficulty, was ever attacked, was ever in need of assistance or help, that 
America would put its arm around our country and he would protect us. Mm. I mean, to me, this man, yes, he's very straight talking and perhaps he, to- he, he pe- politicians don't like the way he talks, but he is a friend of ours and a friend of ours and we need friends. The United Kingdom needs friends and we should really be holding our arms outstretched to this man. Yeah, he, 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 he's mentioned, he t- I think his biggest problem, he tweets, and maybe he shouldn't tweet as much as he does, but it's just, it's just, just endemic of what he does. Well, the tweets, Joe, get him into trouble. Joe, the tweets get him into trouble, but equally, the tweets probably won him the presidency. Yeah, probably it did, but that's, that's his only, own, only, only fault, and we're all, we all have our faults. But he is our friend, and I think, uh, I have never changed mm. my opinion of him right from the word go. There's been, I've always thought, that he w- would be good for England, uh, the United Kingdom. I still think he'll be good for the United okay. Kingdom. We need, to, we, need to, we need to bring him into us, not push him away. Joe, brilliant. Thank you. And Joe, who met the Donald way back in 1986, um, and makes the point, when did you ever hear a US president as openly and as explicitly say, we are here to help you and defend you if it's ever necessary? And I never, ever, ever would betray any words of private conversation that I've had with Trump. But I can tell you, in general terms, he loves this country. His mother came from the Scottish Western Isles. He's got a huge affection for the United Kingdom, for the Queen. Uh, You know, and he kind of regards himself, yes, he's American, but he's very deeply aware of his British and Scottish roots. You're listening to the Sunday edition of The Nigel Farage Show. Is the Donald a better president than you thought he might be? Tony says, we need a Trump here. May is useless. We'll come to that at the top of the hour. Nigel, most people who've been opposed to Trump and Brexit are now going to be too scared of coming on your show to admit they were wrong or might have been wrong. You were right on two fronts, Nigel, but how many people even at LBC will admit that, says Gary from Epsom. Well, I'm sure one or two LBC presenters wouldn't ever want to admit that. But the Donald, he He's controversial. He gets involved in fight after fight after fight. He's the best thing, by the way, that's ever happened to the media. And particularly the New York Times and CNN, who he attacks relentlessly as being fake news. And you know what? Their subscriptions keep going up. Claire is calling from Edgware. Good morning, Claire. Yes, good morning. I think uh, the American legal system is what is going to protect us from Donald Trump because the 300% tariff on Bombier goods had his full backing and thank goodness the courts uh, chucked it out, uh, threw it out and put it down. But all Trump does is when he's abroad, he's stuck to the script. He's very good at reading auto cues. But we know his history. When he was... um, When he was building properties in New York, he was prosecuted for racism in the distribution of his apartments because he refused to rent his apartments to um, African Americans and um, anybody who wasn't white, Anglo-Saxon, basically British. Uh, descendant. So therefore, the man is not going to change his spots. He's our friend today because he was in Davos. When he gets back to America, he'll revert to kind. And he's about perpetuating himself the massive tax cuts, although they'll take a long time to feed through, they're only going to benefit the top 1% because, as we all know, if we've got friends in America, uh, most people earn about twenty or $30,000 a year. And you need to earn at least $75,000 to benefit. And this thing that they're going to repatriate all these millions and millions, even if they do, who says it's going to be um, distributed to the people? It's just going to be used Mm. as cash reserves. Well, Claire, on the the charge, on the charge of racism, um, overnight he's announced that, in fact, he's he's going to make a very big concession to a number of illegal immigrants in America, the so-called dreamers. Um, And I think that's interesting. But also, Claire, let me come back at you with this point. One of the things that Trump said at Davos was how proud he was that the number of black and Hispanic Americans that were now in work was an all-time record. And he genuinely feels, in the first year, he's done more for poverty in the black community than Obama did in eight years. The benefits that are coming through for the black community in America now, and as a black person, I've got a lot, lot of friends over there, were put in train... When Obama was in, to, to, for him taking the credit, he's been in for a couple of months, is ridiculous. Many of the benefits, and also there were more jobs created in Obama's era anyway, if you, if you actually check him out. But he's taken an awful lot of credit for what Obama did. He wanted to get rid of the Affordable Health Care Act, which would have affected most, mainly black people. And although what he's done is he's um, 
taken it. He's for, he's taken it. Uh, taken away the demand that small companies provide it, and, and he's taken away the demand that everybody has it. So eventually, an awful lot of people are going to slip out. But he wasn't able to abolish it. So what he actually the impact. He says he's created more jobs for African-American people. There might be more black people working in McDonald's. Yeah, there might be more black people working in Walmarts. I don't know. But he's taken an awful lot of credit for what he didn't actually do. But people are being fooled. All Donald Trump is able to do Claire, 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 Claire. The the U.S. stock market has risen 30% since he was elected. Don't you think he's got something to do with that? Yeah, well, the tax cuts. You know, if you slash corporation tax... The big businesses, of course, are going to benefit, and that's going to improve the stock market. But if you read up on people who've written about it, they say in a few years' time, America's going to take the hit for that because uh, they're going to, because of the tax takes they're going to lose. Because unfortunately, and apparently, um, George W. Bush did the same thing when he started, and then America's deficit went up a couple of years later because the money was not repatriated in the droves. Well, I tell you what, it, it would be Claire. Claire, I will absolutely put my neck on the line. There will be the repatriation of hundreds of billions of yeah, hundreds of billions of dollars, and that is going to happen. But Claire, the other point, and you know, you make this point that he's one thing here and he's a different thing when he goes back to America, um, and you imply that he's only our friend for for the day. I don't know. I mean, the one thing that Piers Morgan, who you know, has got this interview tonight, and very well done him, but Piers Morgan does not have the same politics as Donald Trump. Absolutely not. You know, Piers has traditionally been Labour supporting in this country. But Piers says the one thing about Trump is if he's a friend of yours, he's utterly loyal. Um, and Claire, you know, he did say to me, I will be your friend for life. Now, if you're right, he will drop me very, very quickly. We'll wait and see. Claire, thank you for your call. Thank you very much indeed for your points. Kevin is calling from Uxbridge and a first-time caller to the Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. You're a great fan of yours, by the way. I wish there was more politicians in this country like yourself. But not trying to put a head above the parapet. Oh, I don't, I, I've, I've done a bit of that over the years. Yeah, and, and, and when I get back to Trump, I'm, I'm a fan of his. Um, whilst I'm not might not agree with everything the man says or does. He's a not career politician. I'm going to keep this brief. I know you want to get people on. He's not a career politician. He's doing it. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Sometimes he doesn't think as clearly as he could, but he's a human being. But what I think he's got the interest of the country at heart, he's not looking to further his career or heighten his financial uh, bank balance. And like yourself, Nigel, he puts his head above the parapet all the time, gets it blown off, mm. head back on, and faces and marches on. This country lacks... Um, people like that in politics. They're all career politicians in this country, which is why we're in the state. Nigel, set up a new set up a new party and get out there and, and, and take us out of this mess that this country's in. Well, Kevin, we're going to discuss all that after 11 o'clock, I promise you. But it's difficult, of course, it's difficult, Kevin, to discuss Trump and not at the same time, you know, compare him, I guess, in many ways, to Theresa May. When you just heard those clips of him saying that if he'd been in charge of the Brexit negotiations, he'd have handled it very differently. Uh, do people like you, Kevin, rather wish he was our leader and not Mrs May? So I wish we had a strong leader. Uh, again, I don't care what party it is. Bring back, bring back Thatcher, even, for God's sake. Someone that's, again got backbone and spirit well, to take this country to, you know, and, to, to where it should be. And Blair had backbone and spirit too, whether people like him or not now, post the Iraq war, but at least with Blair as leader, he did give us some idea of where we were actually going. Kevin, I, I thank agree, you. I agree with that. I agree with that. Thank you. Kevin, I thank you very much, and thank you uh, for calling the show. If Trump was British, we'd have a leader who wanted the best for his country, if only. So there's somebody anonymously there, um, you know, via Twitter, backing up those previous comments. Jonathan is calling from Finchley, and Another first-time caller. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Nigel. Um, I'm absolutely, li literally, just super curious about how people can brush aside uh, the aspects of Donald Trump and the way he's talked, the way he carries himself, and the way he represents the United States, and 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 give him words of support. I, I just don't get it. When 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 he, week after week, day after day, we read what we read what he says and hear what he how he how he um, carries himself. I, I, it's just amazing. I, 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 regardless of the economy, and even if he's good for America or good for the world, whatever, just his, his, the way he expresses himself, it's, it's nothing short of disgusting. Well, That's the only way I can think of it. Jonathan, just, a lot of people agree with that. A lot of people agree with that. But when he's gone abroad, when he's been, and you know, you've seen it over the last year, he went to Riyadh, he's been, of course, to Paris, he, he's been to Beijing. I mean, when he's out there, 
on the world stage, would you not agree that he's actually surprised people how well he's carried himself? I, I actually, th I go further than that. Um, there's a guy called Scott Adams, a Dilbert guy, and if you've heard any yep. of his, he does, he does blogging, vlogging, and, and I watch him vlog, and he explains how effective Donald Trump is, and he's, he's been very effective in the sense that he's built up an empire um, with you know, Trump Tower all over the world, etc. So he's obviously got some skill, and, and they can be, 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 be put to good use um, for, for, the, for the United States and the rest of the world. I'm not saying he doesn't have skills. I'm just saying, for me, um, those skills are completely overwhelmed by the fact that he doesn't tell the truth, that he, that he insults people, that he calls people names, he bullies people. And, and, and to have that so in your face all the time um, it is to me to, for people not to see that and be and be affected by that and say well it's all very nice all the good potential he has but I'm sorry yes to have the world's greatest nation the most important job in the world be represented by by mm. this, this reprehensible behavior I don't understand how people can't at least well, acknowledge it's a problem do you think Jonathan that he's vulgar and coarse uh, it's not I wouldn't label him as vulgar of course I would just say that his behaviour, the the kind of things he says and does, are are show show a distinct lack of sensitivity of mm. understanding. It's bullying, lots and lots of lying. Um, this whole fake news thing, where he where he, he disses a really decent journalists who are doing a really fantastic job, such as so important for a free society, and he, he disses them as fake news. Well, it's, it's terrible. It's Jonathan, disgusting. Jonathan, do you not think that given the way the Democrats have declined? in the United States of America. And it was John Sopel who, who made this point, which is from the BBC. Sopel made the point that the Democrats are in such a mess that effectively CNN and the New York Times are no longer objective reporters of news, they're now the opposition. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I, I'm not, I don't watch that much CNN here, here in the UK, but, no. um, uh, but I, I will say that because um, he caught publicity so much, deliberately or not, um, it's very difficult not to be shocked and to be... I, re I read a tweet or a, from, recently from the White House that, 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 that can... Oh, no, it's an email. I, I'm on the Donald Trump email thing saying that, you know, 95% of the news are, are anti-Trump or whatever. Well, he, he, he brings that on himself and he complains about well, it. Well, Jonathan, people, Jonathan, he may well do. Jonathan, your points about his style and what he says, you find him unacceptable. You're not on your own with that. You're listening to the Sunday edition of The Nigel Farage Show. Now, I fully accept that I've been in a minority in this country of saying that I thought Trump would be good for America and good for us. Indeed, last year, a uh, YouGov poll showed that only one in three Brits would accept an offer to meet Donald Trump at the White House, which seems to me to be absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and still, according to a Sunday Express poll today, still 56% of people think that Trump shouldn't be given a state visit. So, I, you know, I'm coming at this from a, a minority position, but I am asking you whether your views perhaps have changed a little bit, seeing what he said at Davos and the clips already that we've seen from the big Piers Morgan interview coming out tonight. And before the break, we were talking about his battle with CNN, the New York Times and many others. Lorraine says the way Trump is reported by the biased media is disgusting. That's the other point of view. Stuart says, can you trust any news outlet these days? Much better get it from the horse's mouth. And that, Stuart, is exactly why he uses Twitter. He uses Twitter to go round the back of the mainstream media that he so openly despises. And of course it is reciprocated too. Uh, Trevor is calling from Alston in Cumbria, another first time caller to the show. Good morning, Trevor. Good morning, Nigel. It's a pleasure. Good morning. Well, thank you very much for giving us a call. So how do you see Trump? You know, I mean, has your view of him softened a little bit? I'd like to clone him and bring him over here. Now, if you, if you were to clone a New Yorker, and even by uh, the standards of Americans, who can be pretty straight and pretty blunt, New Yorkers are in a whole different league. His style, Trevor, wouldn't work in this country, would it? I don't know. It worked with me. I mean, I'd like that last gentleman to listen to his uh, speech to the, the farmers yep. in America. It was phenomenal. Uh, you know, people. I don't think the people who don't like Trump actually listen to him because if they did, they couldn't say what they say. They couldn't. It's impossible. Well, what they see, Trevor, 
what they see, Trevor, are some comments that he makes that at times they consider to be vulgar, they consider to be offensive, uh, they don't think he behaves with the diplomatic skills that a US president should. That's what they'd say, Trevor. Anyone with a brain, Nigel, knows that any man, in any, if, if, if every man in this country was held to account for what he said in a bar somewhere, then none we, of us oh, would we'd all be in, yeah, we'd all be in quite exactly. a lot of trouble. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, go on. No, I accept that point, Trevor. But I look, I, I, where I will agree with you is that the whole point about this historic Brexit vote was that there was a fork in the road that the British people decided to take, and I think what Trump is saying is that if he was our leader, he'd have said, right, OK, do you know what? We've made a decision. Let's just get on with it. And May is, sim yeah. and May is simply not doing that. So I do think, in terms of his decisiveness, uh, right now, that's pretty much exactly what the country needs. I still say, Trevor, I don't think Donald Trump would quite work um, in Number 10 Downing Street. Well, maybe not. But I'll tell you what would work, Nigel, is you and a bunch of people like Rhys Mogg and a few others get together and bail us out of this because otherwise we're going to end up out we're going to end up in europe and i, vo I voted to get out yep, totally yep. out I, there was no i didn't think of any all i wanted it was to have our power back have our borders closed and then when we're out then we start to negotiate you don't negotiate with somebody before you leave that's crazy Trevor, thank you for your call. More of that after 11 o'clock. When Trump visits, 300,000 snowflakes will protest on the streets. The other 50 million of us won't. The Donald is welcome, says Mark in Bournemouth. Well, Mark, you know, uh, the idea that we give state visits to Mugabe, to Hirohito, to Al-Assad, to all sorts of leaders all over the world with questionable at best human rights records, and yet... It appears to be the official position of the Labour Party that we should not have Trump come to the country and protest on the streets is not only of itself extraordinary, but utterly self-defeating when here is somebody who says in our hour of need he will be there and he wants a closer trade relationship. I find it incomprehensible, Mark. But there we are at the moment. We're still... According to this poll this morning, we're still in a minority, although not an overwhelming one. It's becoming more like 50-50. And I do think, I feel, that there is a slight softening of views when it comes to Trump, that he's actually been a bit, a little bit better, um, or not quite as bad as people thought he might have been as president. Uh, Steve is calling from Berkhamsted. Good morning, Steve. Hi there, Nigel. Hi. Good morning. Uh, no, uh, your, your uh, research you asked me the question... Um, do I like Nigel, uh, Do I like um, Donald Trump more now than yeah. I did eighteen months ago? And the answer is, I adore the man more now than I ever did. Adore him. I've looked, I, I love him. I absolutely <laughs> love him. Um, I, I do. I, 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 you know. And um, the thing is, I've been watching Donald Trump, you know, on telly for the last thirty, forty years, just like all of us. And I've always sort of, uh, back in my head, I've always sort of thought. Is something going to happen with this guy? He's going to be something. And, and, and uh, I'm not lying. About 18 months, two years ago, he ran for president. You know, he paid for it all himself. You know, he, he, the establishment in America don't like him because he knows the truth about the Twin Towers. He knows about JFK. He knows about all the, all the fiddles and everything they've done. They just don't like it. It's the same, it's the same with, our, with, our, with our movement in this country. You know, I'm a, a Brexiteer like yourself, and have been. I've been speaking about it for the first 35, 40 years. I mean, my dad used to tell me off about it when I was in my early 20s. <laughs> so, I'm not joking. Before, before you, probably before you, Nigel. Know, and um, seriously, and I've campaigned. I mean, I, I, I drove my canal boat. I live on a canal boat. I drove my canal boat for six weeks in the campaign 18, 18 months ago with massive great vote lead stickers. Did on you really? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. All over, all over the Midlands, all over, all over South, South East London, and everything, and all the rest of it. And uh, you know, you could tell, you could tell if you was driving the boat closer towards London, more and more people were putting their nose up. But, but you know, you know, the, the problem is the media um, is run by the establishment. I don't need to tell you this. But the media is run by the establishment. We've got people like Tony Blair trying to sabotage, um, you know, what we're what we're trying to do. We certainly have. Um, and you and you know you know all that. I mean, you, 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 I don't. Yeah, well, I, I, is, Steve, I don't know anything about Trump's views on the JFK assassination or the Twin Towers. But what I do know um, is what I do know 
is that he's taken on the establishment in a most remarkable way. He's been underestimated at every single stage of this. And I was told, I was told, Steve, at the late September 2015, a friend of mine said he'd been and watched Trump speak. He said, Mm -hmm. you watch this, it's unbelievable. And at that stage, even I thought, you sure? Are you really, really sure? And he's and no one thought he could win those primaries. No one no. thought he'd get the nomination. No, no one no. thought he could win the presidency. And he's surprised people all the way through. And Steve, no. you've been with him from the start, but I think he's going to go on surprising people. Steve, I thank you very much for your call. Love to have seen that canal boat during the six weeks of the referendum campaign. Uh, Robert is calling from Ripley. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thanks. So, how did Trump perform in Davos? Okay, I think that there are a few points here. In Davos, I think we need to really just sit down, and it's like having the, the sort of drunk uncle come to a wedding and everyone holds their breath, hoping he doesn't do anything silly. And now we are hailing someone when he's coherent, which is not what the leader of the free world needs to be praised. The fact that he can hold a few sentences together is not enough. So I'm not impressed by the fact that... Robert, Robert, that line is dreadful. And what we're going to do, given that you've clearly got some very, very strong views on Donald Trump indeed, we're going to get you back in a moment. Trump's not perfect, but he's right about Brexit. A tougher negotiating stance is needed, says Helen. My views of Trump are the same as they were when he got elected. Trump is a true hero. He's making America great again. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, There are lots of you who are worried about Trump and his style. Those of you that like Trump seem to absolutely love Trump. It's fascinating. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. There's no doubt he is the most controversial politician that's ever been elected to lead a Western world country. And he just happens to lead the biggest, richest and most powerful of them. Yes, it's Donald J. Trump, the 45th president of the United States of America. And, you know, he got a really, really bad press in this country in the run up to that election. And it may well be that he deserved it. But I'm asking you, a year and a bit in, given his speech in Davos, given what we've seen of the interview that'll be played at 10pm tonight on ITV with Piers Morgan, given what he said about wanting to come to the aid of this country if ever we have our hour of need and wanting good trade relations, I'm simply asking you, have your views of Trump changed? I'm going to go to James in Penner and ask that very question. Good morning, James. Good morning, Nigel. Yeah, um, I would say, yes, my views have definitely changed. I mean, in my family, I've got a number of English teachers, um, accountants, doctors. Um, Trump's style of communication is so without finesse. It's uh, incredible. <laughs> his, use, his use of English is, is, you know, it's probably around about a nine-year-old, I would think. And um, it, it, it just there is such a contrast between him and his predecessor that, um, you can't help but have your senses sort of assaulted by the way that he he communicates. But the the reality is that when you peel that back and you say, well, what is the guy actually talking about? Um, we all align with some of his key messages. I mean, he's really going on about globalisation in in the main, whether you want to call it borders, when you want to call it trade. He's actually talking Keynesian economics, which actually is more socialist than than uh, than. Uh, it's certainly else. certainly that element of it's more left of centre, James. Yeah, yeah, and and so what our view, and, and I've seen this amongst other people now that have been close to. I, I, you know, initially people were absolutely outraged at, at his uh, his approach to things. They just saw him as a, an outright racist. Um, and, and a bigot and all those things that you hear so often. But now people are starting to see what he's doing and um, it, and people are now starting to see it and, and understand it. Because I think in this country there's, been, there's this thing, they call it a post-truth era, don't they? And really that's, that's what the, the press like to call it. The reality is, is that the voting public now, they don't vote based on what they hear through the media. They vote on what they see in their schools, what they see in their neighbourhoods, what they see in the streets. And, on so- and James, and place. James, and on social media too. They, that's true, but I think people have always got a le- we've got there is a level of suspicion around social media. We know there's stuff out there that, that you'd say, well that doesn't really stack. Mm. But 
the reality, people are not voting based on what they're reading in the, in the mainstream media. They're voting on their personal experiences, and there's nothing that mainstream media is going to do that's going to change that. And that is exactly the same in America. You know, they talk about the Rust Belt. It's people's experiences, and they yes. can listen to the likes of Hillary Clinton and stuff like that. And they're going, doesn't work for me. My street is, is falling apart. You know, all the shops are gone. You know, I don't recognize the, the culture of half the people that are living around me. Uh, it, it's, you know, people are, feel like they're living in a foreign land. You know, James, when I, went, when I went to Mississippi and I shared that platform with Trump, afterwards, I went into the crowd to talk to people, to hear what they had to say, and it was just like meeting a crowd of people in the Midlands of the north of England who were intending to vote Brexit. They were exactly the same people with exactly the same kind of frustrations. James, finally, can I just, just ask you, if he carries on the current course, will he, in your opinion, win a second term? Difficult. I would say yes. On balance, yes. On but balance, yes. Depends, they, depends if they put um, um, who they put up against. Them. Oh well, it'll probably be Hillary Clinton again, of course, because she's determined. <laughs> she's determined <laughs> to be the first female <laughs> president of the USA. And I tell you what, whatever baggage Trump may have, she's got even more, and certainly her husband does. James, I thank you very much indeed for your thought and your call. And James, there, yeah, you know, saying actually that, that, that Trump can be um, a bit of a shock when you first confront him, but he isn't doing too badly. Jason in Watford. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Nigel. How are you? I'm very well. Now, what do you think of the Donald one year on? Well, my opinion hasn't changed. It's always been the same. Yep. Um, the question I need to ask you is why, do we, why are we judging him when he's only been doing this job for a year <laughs> well because it's a very good moment at which to judge him isn't it really he's been there a year he's been to davos he's done his first overseas interview with piers morgan which goes out tonight at 10 o'clock on itv i'd have thought now was a great time to be judging no, uh, how he's doing i think now's a ridiculous time because he, there's nowhere near enough time to actually put into words or put into action the words that he's actually talking about so you know there's no wall being built yet um there's loads of different factors to to the job that he's doing. And you can't just judge him, like, when he hasn't had the chance to actually do what he says he plans on doing. Well, well, it's Jason, just, Jason, I would... I, OK, let me just th throw this back at you very quickly. Um, he's made some big changes through appointments in the American judicial system. He has deregulated thousands of laws in America that have been scrapped. And he's managed an absolutely historic reform of corporate tax. That, I mean, how would you judge him on those things? Well, I'll, ju I'll judge him when we see the, the benefit of what he's done. So you can do lots of different things that will sometimes will be very successful and sometimes yep. don't. But within his first year, you can't judge him on how successful that these, these changes are going to actually be. Okay. My, 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 my concern is that he's, he does an awful lot of talking, and we keep going on about, and I've heard him say it, I've heard you say it, about how well the American stock market's doing. So that obviously reflects on how wonderful Donald, Donald Trump's doing. But we keep sort of putting down Theresa May, and yet our stock market's probably better now than ever. Well, um, yeah. I, I think the, the big difference, of course, is uh, that our stock market... Um, our stock market is full of companies, most of which are outside the United Kingdom. They're Chilean copper mines and various other things. So I think, to be honest with you, um, the FTSE is, is, is now more of a global stock index than it is a uk index we need to look to the all share 250 whatever to, to to get a better measure jason okay fine you've made the point that he needs to do more to prove himself and time will tell what about in terms of perception because i mean he was seen as the devil by many people but i think that's still the case by many people and i think this look i i have never seen him as the devil and i just think he's a very very clever man and i think um he, he's a marketing genius so often he'll say things he doesn't really believe. Often people think, oh, he's a racist. Of course the man's not a racist. You know he's not a racist. I know he's not a racist. But sometimes he'll make ignorant comments because he knows there's certain people that will back him for saying that. But does he, is he a racist? No. No, but he's got his own style, hasn't he? Listen, I thank you very much indeed for your comments. And let's just remember, folks, you know, he's not very far away from being 72 years old. He's kind of done it his own way for the last 50 years. And people saying he should tweet a bit less... 
It just isn't going to happen. It's going to go on. This presidency will go on exactly the way that it is, um, giving global news headlines every single day. We are going back to Robert in Ripley. Hello, Robert. Hello, Robert. Uh, hello, Nigel. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to say it, it's like having the drunk uncle at a wedding and uh-huh. everyone holds their breath. Uh, that he doesn't do anything silly. That is what happened in Davos, quite simply. The fact that the man is coherent is something that we're having bank holiday celebrations for. It's just ridiculous. That's the first point. The second point is this. If any politician, including yourself, was caught on tape, categorically it was their voice on tape talking about grabbing a female in her private parts without their permission, I want you to tell me this. Would anyone in the UK have a job, and should they be in any kind of public office afterwards? Okay, well, Robert. I really would like you to answer that okay, question. Okay, well, let's deal with both of those, shall we? The first one, about the embarrassing drunk uncle. Everyone crosses their fingers. Let's hope he doesn't get drunk, and can we shove him into the back of a car before the dancing starts? Yeah, understand that. Um, point is, Robert, he's been going all over the world, starting off with Riyadh, going on to Beijing, going to Warsaw, uh, Paris... Brussels. In fact, he's been almost everywhere apart from the UK. Um, And the point is, Robert, I think, I I mean, I put this to you, I think he's surprised people the way he's held himself on the world stage. Because the bar is that low now. That's the bottom line. The bar is that low now. Well, because because of the low grade of many of our Western world leaders, that may well be true. And your second point, look, you know, if if people in America had thought that what Trump had said literally was true, he wouldn't have won the election. It was seen as extreme alpha male boasting. And, Robert, uh, would people in this country put up with that? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, and a previous caller said this, if any of us at any point in the last 20 years had been recorded saying something in private in our worst moments, it could be portrayed in a very negative light, couldn't it? Well, then we wouldn't be running for the highest office on earth. The, the third point... Well, that made, no, Robert, I tell you what, I'd love to take your third point. We've had two goes at this phone call. Time, I'm afraid, has run out. Thank you all for your views on Trump a year on. And whether, and whether your views have softened a bit towards him, I think the polling suggests that perhaps they have. But coming up in a moment... I said a few months ago there was a great Brexit betrayal and there's danger we might leave the European Union in name only and then our phrase is being banded about by others. Jacob Rees-Mogg even warning that the next election could be lost unless she gets this right. So, is the Tory party on its current course doomed? And if you think no, it's all going to be absolutely fine, then call me on 0345 6060 Or if you think, do you know what? I might not bother to vote for them. If they don't deliver Brexit, then text to 84850. And if you've got a message for Mrs May, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, watch me live on Facebook and comment there too. Last January, the Lancaster House speech, and I sat in this studio as somebody who'd fought against the Conservative Party for over two decades. I listened to what Theresa May had to say, and I said, wow, this is amazing. She's saying all the things I've been fighting for. It was all worth it. It's great. But it didn't take me very long through the course of the general election campaign to start to lose faith. And indeed, as early as last July, I wrote in the the Daily Telegraph, the great Brexit betrayal has begun. I then wrote in September, the great Brexit betrayal continues. And after the various concessions made in December um, at the summit, such as 40 billion, I was barely able to contain myself. I don't think she's holding true to Brexit. I don't think she's right to be leader. And I think they're headed on a path of total destruction if she remains. That has been my view for months and months and months. And I know lots of you have been really, really angry with me, particularly Conservative voters saying I'm I'm rocking the boat, I'm causing trouble. Well, just look today, Jacob Rees-Mogg basically saying, look, unless they keep faith with Brexit voters, they may well lose the next general election. And former cabinet ministers like Theresa Villiers saying the whole thing is being watered down. But perhaps to get a bit more objectivity 
onto this than me, where I've nailed my colours to this mast. So clearly, I'm joined this morning by Isabel Oakeshott, political commentator, former political editor of the Sunday Times, a Conservative commentator, without being a Conservative Party member. Isabel, good morning. Good morning. Well, I'll try and be objective, but I'm probably about as wound up as you are at the moment. <laughs> I think we're at a very, very dangerous point for Brexit, aren't we? Yeah, I think we are, and I. it kind of seems to me that on the current course, the best we're going to get is Brexit in name only. And I say that because she seems to be dead set on taking us into this transition period. And yet, and Isabel, perhaps you can explain this to me. You know, why is it that when the prospect of a transition period, meaning effectively continued membership of the EU, uh, but without any say, why did the Parliamentary Party put up with it back in December? Well, I think that there is just so much fear within the Parliamentary Party of what happens if they pull the plug on this operation. And, you know, the reason that we're getting so much manoeuvring from a number of Cabinet Ministers and those outside the Cabinet at the moment is precisely because this is a critical point in the Brexit negotiations. I could name, I think, at least four uh, senior Tory party figures, Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, Gavin Williams, the Defence Secretary, Priti Patel, the ousted international National Development Secretary and Jacob Rees-Mogg, who are absolutely on manoeuvres uh, within the Tory party at the moment and are beginning to wonder whether this is their moment to to strike against Theresa May. And I think it's, it's fairly hanging in the balance for her. Perhaps that's overstating it a bit. Uh, I think there could either be a leadership contest that kicks off in the next few weeks. If that doesn't happen, she probably survives for another year and everything that you and I fear about Brexit, that there is some kind of catastrophic sellout and this new thing Brino, Brexit in name yeah. only, may come to pass. Yeah, and of course we heard rumours yesterday that the transition, and I've been saying this again for months, that the transition period wouldn't be around about two years, it would actually be three <laughs> years, which would then take us to the next general election. Now that really bothered me and I think that is potentially dynamite and I'm rather surprised actually that more papers uh, this morning haven't picked up bigger on that on that story. You know I always feared when they said around two years mm. that around two years meant nothing of the sort that was close to two years and meant around three or maybe even four. Uh, you know you learn in p um, political commentary and as a political observer to interpret language and the word around uh, is is a dangerous one in this context i yeah. think now a great favorite of this show and i get texts and tweets and they're, they're all they're, i've got a load of reese mogg fanatics um and i think across all lbc programs at reese mogg but it seems to me that he's gone from being amiable backbencher mm. in the space of a couple of weeks to heading up this conservative party group can you explain what that group is and what this really means well, I think there's no doubt that, uh, certainly in my mind, that Jacob Rees-Mogg is serious about running for the Tory party leadership. You know, some people dismiss Jacob Rees-Mogg. One expression I've heard is uh, that he's a kind of meme that's gone too far, a kind of <laughs> a kind of human Boaty McBoatface, a national joke that's suddenly become all too serious. I think if anyone who um, is nerdy enough, like me, to have watched the uh, video footage, the film footage of him dissecting the position of the Brexit, Secretary David Davis in a, in a parliamentary committee meeting last week would not underestimate Jacob Rees-Mogg's intellect. You know, he is a forensic uh, examiner of political positions and, you know, clearly he feels utterly passionately about the uh, proper delivery of Brexit and indeed has said no nothing and nobody except the Queen is more important than Brexit to him. So I think what we're seeing is A, his leadership ambitions, but perhaps it's unfair to focus too much on that. It is more for him about Brexit being delivered in the way that 17.4 million people voted for. And where he becomes very dangerous to the Prime Minister is if he has enough of a group around him to really pose a difficulty for her when it comes to parliamentary votes. And, you know, really, that's yeah. not actually that difficult, is it? And I, you know, I watched that exchange. And as you say, it was forensic. Uh, and David Davis kept laughing. And it was a very nervous kind of laughter. But isn't really, of all the figures in the Cabinet, isn't the David Davis position the most curious of all? Because don't we know, listen, I shared platforms with him up and down the country, that Davis is the man who really wants us to crack on with Brexit, and yet is having to push what I see as a compromise line coming from a divided Cabinet. 
I, I'm bemused watching David Davis, who, like you, is somebody I've known for a very long time. Um, I've got great respect for him. He has always been a, a staunch Eurosceptic. And when he was put in that position as Brexit Secretary, I found that immensely reassuring. And something odd has happened to him in recent months, or even, you know, perhaps it began to happen as soon as he got into government and realised, you know, just how difficult it was to carry out what he wanted to carry out. But I don't see the same man as as I, I, I know. You know, he looks different. He looks tired. Uh, he looks as if uh, he's finding it all. I mean, you know, he is, I don't know exactly how old he is, in his late 60s, 68, I think. He is, I, yeah. think um, I think he's under an enormous amount of pressure but it's interesting that Tory, uh, you're a sceptic MP, the, the kind of Brexiteer, the harder Brexiteers feel let down by him without mm. a doubt. I think that's right. And I, as I say, my sense of it is that actually what she's trying to do as Prime Minister is to keep all these different wings of the party happy. And that actually, by trying to keep everyone happy in the end, you probably don't keep anyone happy. Lots of rumours, Isabel, the last two Sunday uh, sets of newspapers the number of signatures or letters that need to go in to trigger a leadership debate and contest is 48. Any gossip or rumours no, on where we are with this that? This is so difficult to nail this one because the, the man in charge of those letters who collects them and keeps them in a safe, Graham Brady, who most people probably haven't heard of. Oh, hang on, hang um, on. I think you're wrong there, aren't you? Oh, you think that they have? No, no. He's just, be, he's just received a knighthood. He's now Sir Graham Brady. Oh, I'm sorry. And isn't the timing, it isn't the timing of that interesting. Well, I look forward to the day when I'm going to be addressing you as Sir Nigel Farage. I shouldn't think so, um, no. But Sir Graham is uh, extremely discreet. That's why he's lasted so long and probably why one of the good reasons he got <laughs> his knighthood. So he never lets on how many letters he's got. But I think it is the case that there are uh, so many that we are sufficiently near the tipping point of the 48 for anyone who's wavering about putting in a letter to be thinking rather harder than they might do if they thought that there were only three letters in that mm. safe. You know, they are now uh, faced with a kind of knowledge that if they put a letter in, they might just be the individual that tips the party into a leadership crisis. And that probably makes people think twice, three times, maybe even four times before they take that step. So if they don't reach the 48, she stays on as leader. <clears throat> the trade negotiations begin at the summit on March the 22nd, 23rd with Monsieur Barnier and our friends over there. But the other interesting thing, of course, is we've got local elections coming up in May of this year. And make no mistake, the Conservatives are terrified of what's going to happen in those elections. There is a widespread uh, expectation that there will be wipeout and a great deal of, of, of fear about that and the consequences of that. But no, I don't. what I don't detect, conversely, is any sort of great plan of how to make sure that doesn't happen. There's almost a, a sort of attitude that it's inevitable that it's going to be a disaster and, you know, it's too late to do anything about it. So those elections come in May, and let's say she survived for now, and those elections are a disaster, there's a possibility then that they reach the number 48. You see, what I'm getting to is this Brexit timetable is, and, you know, I went to see Monsieur Barnier myself the other day, very clear about it, that the negotiations on trade are to end in October before we go through parliamentary ratification. Are they going to make this timetable? It seems a little doubtful, given the EU's history of, as you would know far better than I, of handling these things. Not that there's a comparable situation, but it's not the most efficient of machines. And then let's not forget that everybody disappears for at least all of August. Oh, and, and half, half of July. Of them disappear for much of the summer. So I think it, it is going to be tight. Um, both sides obviously are extremely incentivized to try to come to an agreement. Um, the other thing that was raised to me this morning... Uh, was actually what happens if if the lawyers get involved on the eu side you know my goodness god yeah. help <coughs> us you know we'll be here until the next yeah. millennium well if all goes well for theresa may then she will negotiate some kind of deal it will pass through parliament which is not certain but let's just assume i love the way you say that as if it might be a smooth process well, well it, it, it won't be but i'm just <laughs> thinking i'm just thinking that on the current timetable the next election would be in 2022 but it may well come sooner than that. Are the Tory party, in your opinion, on their current course, doomed to losing the next election? 
I think I would be a bit of a fool to, to make predictions. My predictions have all been a bit rubbish in recent years. I think many in my uh, <laughs> industry would be able to relate to that. Uh, it, it doesn't feel good, I must say. It absolutely doesn't feel good. Um, I've just... Uh, come off the BBC with Jeremy Corbyn, and I'm sorry to say that you know he's actually much more impressive than many of us on the on the right uh, have given him credibility for. I think that the Conservatives have a lot to be worried about. But that said, it's a long time away, and there is an immense opportunity for us in Corbyn's kind of socialism. And he's got a slight spring in his step, Corbyn, hasn't he? Well, he, I think he's had a spring in his step for a long time, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. all, it's all going pretty swimmingly for mm -hmm. him and, you know, the local elections are expected to go well, he's got London, you know. I he's think asked about Brexit, says nothing. It's not, it's not too difficult for them. And gets the away with it. Yeah, well, you may, it's, we're certainly headed for fascinating times. Look, Isabel Oakeshott, former poll head of the Sunday Times, political commentator and conservative leaning, uh, um, uh, not supporter of the party, but conservative causes. I'm happy with that. Thank you for coming in this Thank morning. You. And look, we are going to take your calls now because, hey, LBC is the one place on a Sunday where you, the public, have your say. Is the Tory party on its current course doomed and i would say without a doubt but that's my view tell me i'm wrong by calling 0345 6060 973 you're listening to the sunday edition of the nigel farage show exclusively on lbc is the conservative party doomed on its current course and are we going to get corbyn perhaps in a coalition with the smp next time round? my view is that she's not leading the party she's trying to placate two different wings of it and it simply isn't working unless she goes i think it's all over what does annabelle in twickham think good morning hello nigel i think before the election there was a tim and fiona uh, yes and everything was on course now, now, to, now, Tim, now, now just, just, just to explain Annabelle to people, Tim and Fiona were there in number 10, effectively running the campaign and acting as the gatekeeper for Theresa May. Yes, but now the skullduggery begins that uh, new advisers were appointed and they were Hayward, um, Hayward and, and I will tell you this, I know who's been giving her the script. Okay. Barnwell. Gavin Barnwell. G uh, Barwell. Barwell. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. He was, he was voted out at the last general election. Yep. And yet, he is working for her. As her yeah, he lost, a, he lost a seat in Croydon, didn't he? Yes, um, he did. And what is more is, I don't think, and there was news today on the papers, I don't know whether it's true, but uh, it's, they've, also, they've uh, given Theresa May... Uh, an ultimatum, it's either her or Hammond that goes, because I think that what he said at Davos, um, I think that has uh, got a lot of their well, fire up. doesn't Hammond keep on doing this, Annabelle? I mean, it's really yeah, interesting, isn't it? All of the time. It's really interesting that, that here we've got, here we've got Trump at Davos, saying yeah. one of the reasons America's doing great is we've mm. deregulated. I've got rid of 22 laws for every new one I've made. It, you know, but he is the fly in the ointment. Free everything up, and yet Hammond at Davos is saying we want to keep all the European Union rules for at least the transition period and maybe on into eternity. So is there a possibility here, Annabelle? What if Hammond was got rid of would she then? Would she then look a bit more coherent as a leader? Yes, I think. <clears throat> I think definitely. Right. Definitely, excuse me, please. That's all right. Excuse me. Um, I think she would because I think that uh, it can't be both of them. They can't both stay in. I think that it's either got to be a Hammond or her. Right. So I think that. Uh, so she needs to go up to him and say, "This house ain't big enough for the both of us." Yeah. Yes, and I think that uh, I think he's. He's working for the EU. Okay. Honestly, Annabelle, I Annabelle, feel. Annabelle, I tell you what, in my view, it's not just him. There's lots of them. John is calling from Hailsham in East Sussex. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Nigel. I, I'd like to say, for all serious Brexiteers out there, well, I think we're all in dismay at the Tory party and the, and the way they're uh, the way they're negotiating with Europe at the moment. And obviously, we all seriously worry that the deal we're going to get is going to be, you know, totally useless. And we do really need a few a new, a few uh, Tory MPs out there with the same sort of balls and, and up front 
uh, personality that Donald Trump's got, because half the time we don't really know what they're thinking, do we? No, no we don't, and they sort of hedge around, don't they? Yeah. Um, but, but OK, so, 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 John, John, you're a frustrated Brexiteer. Yep. Um, and Jacob Rees-Mogg is saying, unless Brexit gets delivered properly, people won't vote for Conservative at the next general election. Is, is Rees-Mogg right to think that? I really think he's Nigel, and to be honest with you, I mean, a lot of people at the moment would not want to vote for the Tory party as it stands at the moment. Certainly, if they make a complete hash-up of Brexit, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to lose a lot of votes. But the problem we've got, as Brexiteers, what is the alternative? I certainly don't want to see a left-wing Labour government running my country, but what is the alternative? You know, this is a major problem we're going to have, isn't it? I think that will be, a, a, if things continue as badly as they are, John, that will be a debate. Uh, unless, of course, we see a strongly rejuvenated UKIP or something like it, because it's worth remembering. It's really worth remembering that the only reason the Conservatives got a majority in 2015 is because the UKIP vote, the near four million votes, hurt the Labour Party a lot more than it hurt the Tory Party. And I do think, uh, and UKIP's got its problems at the moment, goodness me, yes, but I, you know, I, I really do think, Nigel, I have actually been a UKIP supporter in the past. Unfortunately, they've had a lot of bad press, you know, with the last leader. They just sort of uh, had to depose. I mean, I really do feel that if, if UKIP could come forward with someone really credible, they would have a chance again. Obviously, I think they did the right thing, deposing the leader they just had. He well... You know, he did have some serious... Flaws. He hasn't gone yet. He hasn't gone yet. They've tried to depose him, and the, um, there is going to be an EGM, an extraordinary general meeting on this on, on the seventeenth of February. But, 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 John, the general point is that is that it's interesting to think that traditionally people said a strong UKIP would hurt the Conservative Party, but a really strong UKIP hurt the Labour Party even more. So let's wait and see what emerges. John, thank you, and John, very much, very much taking that Reese Mogg line that if the party that was elected to deliver Brexit doesn't actually do it, or does it in such a brino, Brexit in name only, Isabel Oakeshott talked about that just a moment ago, uh, that if it does that, a lot of people will just stay at home and will get a Corbyn government. And that wouldn't worry Brexiteers so much if Corbyn had stuck to his own traditional Brexit position. Instead, the Blairites appear to be in charge of the Parliamentary Labour Party, and I would guess probably the writing of the next manifesto too. I don't know. Elizabeth is calling from Shrewsbury. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning, Nigel. I, having listened to Jeremy Corbyn this morning, yep. I would like to call for a general election in the spring of next year. And just as Jeremy has been, um, and I'm previously a Conservative voter, yeah. he has garnered the youth vote. What have we as older voters got to lose by getting behind the Labour Party now? The way the Conservatives are delivering Brexit is an absolute traitorous betrayal of 17.4 million people. And I say... A plague on all their houses, and let us have a general election in the spring. So, Elizabeth, this is fascinating. So you are a passionate Brexiteer, and I can tell that. But you frankly think the Tories are doing it so badly that it wouldn't make, make much difference if Labour were in. I think that Theresa May and her, some of her cabinet have thought that those of us that voted Brexit were so stupid and sick that we would believe their lies. And unfortunately, they managed to garner support from some of the wonderful people that are trying to steer Brexit in the way that we all voted for. And we now, there's only two of us obviously in our house, mm -hmm. but we listened to Jeremy Corbyn and our attitude now is, let's give him a chance. And I hope that at the, at the local elections in May, the Conservatives have, uh, are given the biggest beating electorally that they've ever had. If the Conservatives, Elizabeth, to whom you're naturally aligned, and you said that earlier, if they were to get a new leader who was absolutely clear on Brexit delivery, would that then change your mind back in favour of the Conservatives? It would make us think that the Conservatives were a party who were for the people. And let's not forget, Nigel, 
we see all these politicians at the top pontificating about, as, as, as um, Hammond said at Davos, I, I have given the NHS, no, Mr Hammond, you didn't give the NHS a penny. It's our money. It's our money. Yep. And the way the older vote feels now, they're making us sell our homes to pay for our care and waiting until we're in agony for hip and knee operations. Let's go with Labour and let's see how they give the fascinating. elderly dignity. Fascinating. Elizabeth, that is an absolutely fascinating phone call. I thank you for it. And I haven't heard that argument uh, directly before, but I have to say, I always apply the supermarket test. What do people say to me as I'm going around the supermarket? Because I do go shopping. I buy the essentials, gin, tonic, you know, stuff like that. Um, lemons occasionally. Um, and people do stop me and want to talk to me. And it's really interesting. And one of the things I've been consistently getting for the last few weeks are people stopping me saying, I voted Brexit. This woman does... Is she, you know, are we going to get it, Mr Farage? Is it actually going to happen? And people are genuinely really very, very worried indeed. John from Wales says, Morning, Nigel. I would like Hammond replaced. That's a theme that's developed in the last half an hour. Maybe if Hammond went, things might just be OK. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think it needs much more fundamental change than that. I sense Brexiteers are fuming with Mrs May, and, and Rhys Mogg is right. They're not going to vote Tory unless something big changes. What I mean by that is, they're doomed unless something big happens. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. It's Tory party in deep, deep trouble. Some has got to give, but before I get there, proposal now in Wales to lower the voting age for the elections there in 2022 to the age of 16. And of course this follows similar moves that have happened in Scotland and a bigger debate in the United Kingdom. I am opposed to this. I do not believe you should vote in elections that you're not eligible to stand for. Um, and I don't think the idea of 16-year-old MPs or councillors actually makes any sense at all. If it does come to pass, and clearly it's Labour pushing, pushing, pushing this, of course there's the argument that uh, there's bias in schools and that will generally lead people to be more left of centre. But there's a much more important argument than that, and you can debate the validity of that argument. And it's this, that that generation live on their mobile phone devices, they live on social media, and the Labour Party and Momentum and others are getting quite good at this. Theresa May's Tory party are utterly useless at it, and the Tories need to get a grip on this very, very quickly indeed. But back to the Tories' trouble. I wrote in the Telegraph last July that the great Brexit betrayal had begun. Um, a few people thought I was running a bit ahead of myself there, but hey, there's quite a lot more people saying it. Now, fascinatingly, Jacob saying, you know, they won't vote for us next time if we don't deliver it. Our last caller before the break, Elizabeth, saying she's a Tory, a Brexiteer, but hey, what difference would it make if Labour won? And Tony from Pevensey Bay says, Nigel, I've never ever voted Labour. However, because Theresa May is so hopeless at negotiating our exit from Europe, I will at the next election. Despite the fact that Corbyn isn't really offering us anything positive when it comes to Brexit. In fact, his position from a Bre Brexiteer's point of view is now considerably worse than that of the Tories. But hey, that's where we are, and people are getting pretty angry when I meet them going around the supermarket. Lorraine is calling from Chelmsford. Good morning, Lorraine. Good morning, Nigel. Um, I would just like to say that this is just another betrayal of, of the UK in the favour of the EU. We were betrayed by Ted Heath, who illegally took us in in the first place, mm -hmm. John Major signing the Maastricht, and Gordon Brown with the Lisbon Treaty. Theresa May is not negotiating this. This is being negotiated by the likes of Ollie Robbins, who's been moved out of the Treasury into actually number 10 as her advisor on uh, Europe and anything Brexit. This is the, this is Lorraine, Lorraine, just, just to stop you for a second because not everybody will know his name. So what we're talking about here, Lorraine, is the massive influence of the civil service, yeah? Exactly. Now, the civil service, be it the Treasury, Whitehall, etc., are running the shots here and they always have done. Um, they've all been indoctrinated in the way of common purpose. Now, if people don't know what common purpose is, they ought to look it up. Yeah, OK. We, we won't delve into that now, Lorraine. No, OK. 
okay then we won't we won't we won't delve into this but the thing is there's more the people now are more educated in what this is all about nigel it's about a betrayal they're betraying the the people of this country in favor of the, the global corporations and the banks um the politicians our parliamentarians have vested interest in the eu it's all about money for themselves lorraine if you're right lorraine if you're right in yes. your analysis of all of this, does that mean, on their current course, under Theresa May, that they, will, that they are doomed to losing the next election? Nigel, should I tell you how I feel? As somebody that is, hates the EU, I love Europe, like yourself, and I love different countries and their cultures and identities. This is what makes the, the, the world such a fascinating sure. place. And as you know, they want to destroy that. No, no, I agree with that. But, 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 but Lorraine... Yeah, my, my, my point is, Nigel, if we don't get out of the EU completely, this country is finished anyway. And so let it become communist, because I would have lost all faith in democracy okay. and sovereignty. Okay, no, Lorraine, very passionate, very strong. You're not alone, Lorraine. I'm meeting you around the supermarket aisles. Now, look, surely there must be somebody out there who thinks the Tories are doing a good job. Somebody out there, please call me and tell me that Mrs May is doing it brilliantly and they're going to walk the next election with a monster, monster majority. Please tell me, you must exist. Someone must be out there. Even if you're a sitting MP who rings up anonymously, you can call 0345 973 uh, David, a first-time caller from Mill Hill, is ringing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I saw Jeremy Car Corbyn on the uh, on the Bias Broadcasting Corporation this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, we have to get rid of her. She has to get out. She has to take Hammond with her. How can we have a cabinet that is not a, a, a Brexit cabinet? It doesn't make sense. She's got a load of people in there that are against Brexit. I mean, it's just wrong. I know. And we she, and David, she'd even appointed Lord Adonis to a post, who is just oh, about I, the most fanatical EU person I've met in my life. I'd like to ask you something else. Yeah. What about the accounts, the EU accounts? Have they been agreed? Well, no. th 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 they've not been signed off as a full and true accurate record for 20 years because there are problems, billions missing, talk of fraud, etc. But that's not the debate this morning, David. The debate this morning yeah. is, the debate this morning is that we have a Tory party that says it will deliver Brexit, but wants to give us transition, wants us to be aligned incredibly closely. They're, they're assaulting our intelligence, yeah. Nigel. The yeah. way they're doing it. Yeah. I, I, David, are you, have you been normally a Conservative voter, David? I have been, but for right. many, many years. Okay. And, but, I mean, it, I couldn't bring myself to vote for Labour because I just watched Corbyn on, uh, on, uh, on the yeah. television, and to me, uh, it, I just don't agree. And, uh, and, and having uh, his uh, um, uh, a Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, there as well, uh, taking the money and redistributing it, they haven't thought it through. They want to get, give £10 an hour to everyone. How many businesses will close because of that? And that means the unemployment will go up, and that means that... Uh, well, they, don't care about and, and David, so let alone, let alone what they would do to high earners, and we'd see the 1970s style brain drain happening all over again. And I fear that I'm old enough to remember it, and I fear that too. But David, you know, would you go out and vote for Theresa May if if the other prospect was Corbyn, or if she sells out on the EU? Would you simply just sit on your hands? Survive. I can't believe that she's going to survive because it's just ludicrous, her, her, her situation. She's not a Brexiteer and she was made uh, uh, Prime Minister. It's an insult to us. The fact that she's trying... She, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. D David, it's Sunday morning. You've got to calm down, mate. You know, I mean, I do understand how you feel. <laughs> um, and that's why you picked up the phone for the first time ever to LBC. Thank you, David, very much indeed for your call. Um... Well, let's, let's move on to David in Worksop. David, good morning. Uh, hello, Nigel. Morning. Uh, just a quick call. I'm sorry, but I think Theresa May needs to go now. We are going absolutely nowhere. And what you, you're asking the question, would people continue to vote for the Conservatives? The problem we've got, if you want Brexit, there's, where else do you go? It's, it's partial Conservatives, but every other party, apart from UKIP, is, is, is wanting to remain, and that's the 
problem people will have if there is another election. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, David, the Tory party say they're delivering Brexit. You know, I saw... I saw um, the effective Deputy Prime Minister Liddington this morning. Oh, no, 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 we're, we're carrying out the will of the people. But, I'm th- but I think, David, the scales are beginning to fall from people's eyes, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And William, I'm sorry, Jacob Rees-Mogg is an absolute hero. He's, he, we need somebody like him, because he'll, he'll cause a catalyst of other people who think like him to start coming out and saying, well, we're not doing what we've been asked to do. Mm. And I'd love him to be the Prime Minister, I really would. Well, let's see. I I felt a bit sorry for Jacob yesterday, because I, looking at the Times newspaper cartoon, you know this story, David, in the last week of 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 the two monkeys that have been cloned? Yeah, and it, and it had, uh, and the two monkeys were Reese Mogg and myself. I felt a bit sorry for him. They're going to lump him in with me and everybody else. David, yeah, I he's he. I I think to people of a certain political persuasion, Jacob is, um, you know, a, becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger figure. Um, yeah. But the argument is, David, in places like Worksop, um, as we head up towards the north in Nottinghamshire, that he's just too posh. I know, and we see we've got a good, we've got a really good Brexit MP. John Mann's a good MP, mm-hmm. um, but, but the problem I think is a lot of people in the north won't vote Conservative, even though they want Brexit. No, and that's where you keep. <laughs> Plugged that gap. That's right, and and that was and that was what hurt Miliband so much in 2015. Gave Cameron the surprise majority and yeah. delivered the referendum. David, I thank you. Thank, um, you. thank, thank you. you very much indeed. If May does not deliver the Brexit we voted for, 17 plus million people will never trust the Tories again, and they will be finished. Say Linda and David. Well, some people will still vote Conservative because they'd always vote Conservative, and some people are going to vote Conservative because they fear Corbyn and some real left-wing economics. The question, I think, really, and there may be one or two that switch to to Labour. The question really is, you know, you have to at elections, you have to have your people motivated to go out and vote, and there are a lot. I suspect at the moment, of conservative inclined people who were pro-Brexit who do not like one little bit the direction all of this is going in. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. I've said for months, I think May's the wrong leader, that Brexit is being watered down and betrayed and that it's going to do them an awful lot of harm. Uh, many more people now saying that. Jacob rees hinting over the last couple of days it could cost them votes at the last election, but today on Peston saying, I'm fully supporting the PM because we need to have stability during the negotiations. It makes more sense to back the leader who has a clear position on Brexit. It's a bit like saying the football club, isn't it? We have every confidence in our manager and that he's gone within 48 hours. And we've seen that a few times. But let's keep your views on this coming in. Are they doomed, the Tories, on their current course? I'm going to go to the Isle of Wight and speak to Billy. Good morning, Billy. Good morning, Nigel. Great to talk to you. Uh, I really do think the Tory party is doomed because I, I've previously voted Conservative and I, I did vote for the Conservative party in this last election. Yeah. And unless they get their act together, and that is, of course, going to be without Theresa May as the leader, then, then I'm going to have to have no choice but to vote for an alternative party, and that would have to be the Labour Party. But I don't want to do that, and I think they need to bring in someone like Daniel Hannan, who actually knows what he's talking about, who can actually deal with problems sensibly, and is a strong Brexiteer. But, yeah, but isn't known, isn't, isn't known with the public at all. That would be the problem. Billy, you talk about voting Labour. Are you happy with Corbyn's position on the European Union? I'm not happy with his views at all, actually, on the European Union, because he's, he's not given any view okay. at all. Well, he's... let's... i tell you what, Billy, let's have a little listen, because Corbyn was on the Mar programme this morning, and he was asked the question, would a future Labour government keep the UK inside the customs union? Here's his response. We would want a form of customs union, obviously, whether it would be the customs union answer, no, because it would require being a member of the EU, which we're not. Well, we could agree to be in the customs union without being a member of we, the EU. We, we, could, need we could do to that sure, say we're going we to We need to be sure that any agreement with the EU gives us the chance to influence the situation we're in and the trading relationships we want. Now, look, I would want to see trade relations with the rest of the world going on and increasing, of course, 
but also I would want to see conditions put on those trade, conditions of environmental protection, conditions of human rights, conditions of workers' ability to represent and negotiate themselves. The EU has so that, be a different kind has of that in some form, both in the customs union and within its trading relations, but often not enforced. Surely okay. we want to be an influence for good in the world. So there you go, Billy. That was, that was Corbyn accepting that if we've left, we've left, but actually wanted to keep us incredibly close to the European Union. Would you be happy to vote for that? Well, after hearing that, Nigel, and I'm very grateful for you actually playing that as well to, to me and your listeners, I wouldn't. And it puts me in a very difficult situation because yeah, yeah. I don't know, to be honest with you, Nigel, and I'm not even joking here, I don't think I'd have any other choice but to vote for the Monster Reagan Looney Party at the moment. Well, they've had some... Poli- they, Billy, they've had some great policy successes over the years. Um, in the 1963 manifesto, uh, one of the things that David Such proposed was the all-day opening of pubs, which in those days seemed ludicrous. And hey, it's kind of happen uh, billy I, <laughs> billy the reason i played you that clip is mm. you know we've had a few of you this morning come on the show to say look we're brexiteers she's betraying us it's no blooming good we'll have to vote labor but i just don't think people realize that although corbyn in his manifesto in june talked about not just leaving the european union but leaving the single market taking back control of our borders there has been a transformation they've done, they, they've done a 180 degree turn the labor party and they now basically want to stay in everything talk about brexit in name only it would appear that may as well be at the top of corbyn's manifesto billy i thank you for the call i understand your frustration and your confusion there are a lot of people out there feeling just like that um, dear Nigel, I'm 18 years old and strongly against lowering the voting age. At that age, I feel people can be too impressionable. And unfortunately, there is a great issue within schools where teachers spread their political views, which are typically one-sided, is a response I get from a young voter, as I commented at the bottom of the hour, that I don't think reducing the voting age to 16 is a good and sensible thing to do. Phil is in Enfield. Good morning, Phil. Hello, Nigel. A lone voice. A, a lo- what, you're a the lone voice, voice, Phil? Yes, I'm a lone voice. Go on, then. a heartfelt voice. Theresa May, I admit, appears insipid. But I admire her because she's been knocked around from pillar to post. She's been subjected to so much criticism. But she's brave and she's diligent and she holds the ring. There are a lot of people who talk a brave fight heckling outside that ring, mm-hmm. but they couldn't go in there and stand it. I think we should cut her some slack. I believe she's doing the best she can, and I think sometimes it's better to have a rather insipid person than a colourful personality who can take us to hell in a handcart. And I did vote to leave, by the way. Yeah, I feel I'm often told that, that uh, and, and I'm probably myself a little bit biased in favour. I like the big personality, just the way I'm made. But Phil... <sighs> What does she actually believe in, Phil? I believe she has a sense of duty. I think she's genuinely decent. And I think if I were in her shoes, I'd be so worried about being seen to let down Brexit Mm. that ultimately she might put up all the stops and surprise us. I think we should give her a chance, and I find myself feeling very sorry for her. Well, I think on a human level... I think on a human, on a human level, level, Phil. Yes, but um, also, I think she has she has got a track record of of experience, which many who shout the loudest do not have. Yeah, and some would argue, Phil, it's very bad experience. Home Secretary, the longest serving Home Secretary for 150 years, uh, who presided over an immigration system that was completely, totally out of control. Phil, my problem is this, and I understand what you're saying, you know, it's damn difficult where she is but when she's asked questions like by, by ian dale how would she vote if there's a referendum uh, today she can't answer the question phil it's the lack of conviction and it's this sort of janet daly in today's sunday telegraph says she's like a middle manager she doesn't have the skill set to be a leader that makes big decisions and has the vision rather her being that than someone who thinks he's winston churchill when he's not Okay, all right, Phil, the lone voice from Enfield, I thank you. And I've got time for one last call this morning, and it's going to be Vic, who's calling from Shepherd's Bush. Good morning, Vic. Good afternoon, Nigel. I, I, lovely to talk to you, Nigel. I believe that she's finished, Nigel. And I really believe that it's going to be between either Jacob rees or Boris Johnson. Uh-huh. I have no doubt about that at all, Nigel, none whatsoever. 
certainly people see her as a caretaker, as a caretaker prime minister. And, and it, she's definitely going to be finished this year, Nigel. So with a new um, leader, Vic, with, with a new leader, yeah. would you feel much happier voting Conservative and think that others would that. too? And I think either Jacob or Boris will carry millions of more people on board. I think they have the... Jacob doesn't have the personality of, of, of Boris, but he has, he has that way about him that people love him, Nigel. Well, some do, and I mean, not all do, Vic. Really, really important. Coming up to the... OK. Yeah, no, no, no that's fine. End. That's fine. Vic, I thank you. I've got, I actually have got time for one last, last call. Colin, first time caller to the show from Chester. Good morning, Colin. Good morning, good morning. How long have I got? About 10 seconds. You, you've got, no, you've got 35 seconds. Go for it. OK, I think, I, I've got two points. Um, I think that she's, this is a very, it's a, it's a very uh, clever game they're playing. They, what the EU wants? Um, to see over the table when they're negotiating. Or rather, what don't they want to see? They, they don't want to see Boris Johnson or Jacob rees -Mogg. They want to see Theresa May, don't they? It suits them perfectly, yeah. Because we'll go yeah, on paying exactly. money and all the rest of it. Yeah, so they, they, don't want to, they, they don't want to give us a hard time in negotiations because she'll, she'll go and end up with somebody that they don't want to see. So it could be part of a strategy, I think. Could be. Negotiations are about to start. But, but, they? So they but, but, to. but Colin, given that our time is desperate, I'm sorry, but do call again. I know you're first time caller. Let me ask you very quickly, Colin, are the Tory party doomed on their current course with her as leader? Uh, no, I don't think so. You think so. All right, Colin, I've got to go. That's it. I can't do any more. I've run out of time. Lots and lots of opinion on this. Uh, unsurprisingly, this one will run and run and run. I've been saying for seven months now that the Brexit policy is wrong. They're losing key support. You heard it here first. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show.